This is taken from Ruth 1, 16 through 18. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, there are certain things about life and the providence of life and the journey that we're all on that we sometimes don't expect to happen. In fact, sometimes we see things coming one way and it ends up working out entirely different. I think I may have said to you that Reva and I met while I was a pastor in, uh, in down near Montgomery at Palton and Deepwater. And um, I remember calling up to her church, which was the United Methodist Temple at the time, back in the, uh, uh, 19, in the early 1980s. Their pastor there was a young guy named Paul Mateer. And I said, Paul, would you be willing to help me with a youth event for the district? And he said, yeah, I'll help. And uh, we carried on a conversation, going over the details and so forth, and I hung up. And the phone rang again just a few seconds later. It was Paul calling back. He said, Tim, I need to ask you a question. Are there any single females who will be counselors at this event like you and me? And I said, well, come to think of it, Paul, no. He says, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to bring a single female for you, and you're going to bring a single female for me. <laughs> I said, okay, Paul. So he brought Reba, and I didn't bring anybody. <laughs> the story doesn't end there. And so Reba and I started dating right after that youth event, and uh, Paul would say to me, that Reva, she's something else. She's a great gal. And uh, I said, yes, she is. And he said, she's going to make a fine pastor's wife. I said, well, I don't know about that, but, you know, we'll see. And I remember in the weeks and months ahead as Reva and I planned and, 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 and got engaged and got married, I kept saying to, to Reva, Reva, Paul has a crush on you. Oh, no, we're just buddies. We're just skiing buddies. We're just hangout buddies. I said, no, Reva, Paul has a crush on you. And so Paul finally announced that he had met someone and that they were getting married. And we drove all the way up to Terra Alta from the southern part of the state for the wedding. We got there just a few minutes early, and we asked, where's Paul? And they said, he's downstairs in the fellowship hall with his family. The wedding's going to start here in about 10 minutes. And so we rushed downstairs in this little white frame church in Terra Alta. And the first person that came over to greet us was Paul's mom. She didn't come to me. She came straight to Reva. She took Reva's hand in her hand, and she said, Oh, honey, I thought this would be you getting married today. <laughs> now, sometimes it's not nice to gloat. But I told her many times after that, I was right, you know. Paul went on to have a beautiful life and family, and so did we. But you don't know how things are going to turn out, do you? You see your life headed down one direction, and then something changes. So is the story of Ruth. Naomi, who was a Jewish woman, and her husband, and her two sons, had to travel to Moab because of famine in the land, because of unextenuating uh, circumstances, this is what they did. And while they were there, the two sons married two Moabite women named Ruth and uh, Orpha. And in the midst of that place, tragedy struck. Not only did Naomi's husband, Elimelech, pass away, but so did Ruth and Orpha's husband. So here we have, in the opening verses of this uh, beautiful story, three women in ancient times, 
suddenly and tragically widowed. There was nothing for them to do, and so they decided, or Naomi decided, she would return to her homeland. At least she had some kinspeople there. And she was bitter. If you remember reading the story this week, you'll notice how many times she said, Naomi said, call me bitter. And so Naomi tells her daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpha, that they don't belong together anymore. This tragedy has pushed them apart. And it would be better for them to return to their people and to their families on page 122 in the story, if you have it there with you and you have been following along this week, I'd just like to take a moment to point out. On page 122, it says at the top of the page, that Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home, and may the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. And may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. In other words, these two daughters said to Naomi, We belong together. But Naomi, the next line says, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Could they become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, and even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait till they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. And, as, um, and at this they wept aloud again. And then Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Why don't you go back with her? And that's where the beautiful anthem and the beautiful scripture that was read today, which I think is the most beautiful in the King James Version. Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whithersoever thou goest, I will go. And whithersoever thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Ruth says in one of the most beautiful poetic verses of human history, we belong together. You ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that connection with someone? That you knew you belonged? And yet your heart broke because that connection was severed. Maybe by life, maybe by death, maybe by circumstances that no one could control. Ruth tells Naomi, they belong together. Now, she won't leave her. She's going to stick with her through thick or thin, whatever may come. And so they head back to the Jewish land of which they had left. And when they res return there, many people notice that Naomi has this bitter look on her face, this sadness, this sorrow deep in her heart for all the tragedy that she's gone through. And when she gets back home, Ruth tells her that she's just not going to sit idly by and, and just let their life come to nothing. And so she says, I'm going out into the fields to glean. Gleaning would probably be comparable to a modern day form of, of health and human services. It was allowed, it was a law, it was a practice that people who didn't have the means to support themselves could travel through the fields of anyone and could uh, pick up whatever was left that the harvesters dropped on the ground as a way to make a living. But it was a treacherous way of making a living because sometimes the harvesters were not very kind and sometimes they would take advantage of weak and helpless uh, females in the field. And so Ruth knows that it's, uh, it's something that she must do and Naomi is concerned as well. And it just so happens that she falls upon the field of Boaz. Now, Boaz is 
one of her kinsmen, she doesn't know it at the time, and Boaz asks in, on page 123, about uh, a third of the way down the page, Boaz asks the, asks the overseers of the harvest, who does this woman belong to? You see, Boaz has the understanding, too, that, that everybody should have a connection to somebody. Who does this woman belong to? The overseers reply, she is a Moabite woman who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me gather grain among the sheaves and behind the harvesters. And she came into the field and has remained here from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz says to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. And don't go away from here. Stay here with, the, with these women and work for me. And watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after them. For I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, you go ahead and get a drink of water from the jars that the men have filled. And at this she bowed down her face to the ground and she asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you have noticed me, a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about you. For, you have, for what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with a people that you did not know before? May the Lord repay you for what you have done. My friends, Ruth had a deep, deep sense of kindness and compassion in her heart. She was sorry for her own loss, but she was sorry for her, her mother-in-law. And she decided that she was going to stick with her through thick and thin. Boaz is moved by Ruth's kindness and his commitment to Naomi, and now he believes that Ruth belongs in his fields and with his harvesters. And Boaz will come to believe that he and Ruth and Naomi belong together. Now, in those days, there was a thing called the Leverite Law. The Leverite Law said that if a, if a, a man died having no children, then the nearest of kin would take in the, the widow and raise up children on behalf of that uh, person who passed. And so the Leverite law comes into existence here and Boaz says, I believe that Ruth and Naomi, I should take up that responsibility, but I am not the nearest of kin. There is one kinsman who's nearer than me. And so he calls upon that nearest of kinsmen to to meet him in the marketplace in the city square and he talks with him about the fact that he's going to have to to take responsibility for Naomi and Ruth and raise up children for Elimelech, the deceased husband. And he says, what's in it for me? And he says, you get all of the land that used to belong to Elimelech. I'll do it, he said. I'll do it. And then Boaz says, but now don't forget, you have to raise up children through this Moabite woman. And he says, no, I won't do it. Scholars are unsure as to why he said no. But he did say in the text, it will jeopardize my heritage. I just want to say as I close down here this morning, doing the right thing is not always easy. Doing the right thing, saying the right thing, and acting in the right way challenges us to step across boundaries and cultures that sometimes people don't want to, to consider. Boaz reminded this close kinsman that he must accept his responsibility, but he said, no, I can't do it. There's too much at jeopardy. Ruth had previously said, it doesn't matter where you go or where you lodge or where you live. I'm with you. I belong to you. Physical death does not diminish the conviction that those saints today that we have lit these candles for, that we have placed the, a leaf on the tree of life. It does not diminish the conviction that these souls who have passed away this past year here at Lewisburg United Methodist Church, that their lives and their light and their faith still belongs to us. Look at this verse. Darren, would you pop that verse up on the screen? Oh, up on the screen for me. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, it says, Yet all of these, great people of faith, is implied here, though they were committed, commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, next verse, since God has provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. 
My friends, all those who are seated around us, lift up your eyes and look. I'm not talking about the balcony that's really in the back. I'm talking about the heavenly balcony that goes all the way around the sanctuary. Lift up your eyes right now and look. There are all the saints and they're looking down on us today. And they know something that we maybe forget from time to time. They know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we still belong together. And they're waiting and they're watching and they're hoping until the day we shall join them. And the very next verse after this one that says, so that they would not apart from us be perfect, be made perfect, it says in Hebrews 12, verse 1, seeing then we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that would hinder us and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Oh, I know, my friends, it's very easy to become like Naomi, bitter and upset and frustrated. But the truth is, all those saints that are gathered around us today that know we still belong together, they want us to keep running the race. They want us to keep on keeping on the faith because that's why God gave us this gift of life. Yes, my friends, we belong together and in due time, as that old, old song used to say, in the sweet by and by, or when the, will the circle be unbroken? No, my friends, it won't. Maybe just temporary for a while, but someday we will be together again. Why? Because we belong together. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let those who believe say amen.